Hey folks, your OS Reviews, you're watching our video first look and a quick review of the Samsung Galaxy Centura. This is a phone that was released a few years back as an entry-level prepaid handset, and you can still find it in some stores and online for under 30 bucks without a contract, so it remains a very affordable option, and this version in particular is for track phone. In terms of design, we can see that it's a throwback to the days of the Samsung Galaxy S3 and other Samsung phones which were predominantly made out of plastic and had the inspired by nature slogan and attached to it. As a whole, it's fairly plasticky, but remains compact and easy to slide into jeans and pockets, and feels alright. The front features a 3.5 inch display, which has an average 320 by 480 resolution. That's a far cry from the 720p or 1080p screens we've been spoiled by lately, but again, this is an entry level phone, and for 30 bucks, it works fairly well. It's an IPS panel as well, so it offers decent viewing angles. On the top, there's access to a proximity light sensor and a earpiece. The biggest omission here is a front facing camera, which means that you can't use this for video chatting applications. On the bottom, there are capacitive keys which are backlit for going back home, menu, and back. These keys also offer haptic feedback, so whenever you tap on them, there's a slight vibration as if you're actually tapping on a real button. On the side, there's access to a volume rocker, which is fairly tactile and responsive. The top features access to a standard 3.5mm headphone jack. On the other side, there's access to a power on-off switch, which is nicely placed, and the bottom features a micro USB B port for charging. Battery is fully charged in under two hours and features a merely average 1,500 milliamp hour capacity, which will give you seven hours of rated talk time. And in our testing, it lasted about three to four days of standby mode before we needed to recharge it. So it's definitely one advantage of having a smaller low res screen as the battery drains a lot uh, slower. Underneath here, you have access to the battery, which is removable, that's another plus, uh, and there's also a micro SD card slot that supports cards up to 64 gigabytes. There are four gigs of built-in storage, and what's nice is you can still take a few images and download a few apps before you have to really buy another micro SD card, although that is recommended if you plan on doing tons of apps or tons of media content. With that being said, the phone as a whole remains a fairly fluid experience, despite the seemingly slow single-core 800 megahertz processor. That's the Snapdragon S1. Uh, it's been slightly underclocked here, and it's coupled with, with 512 megabytes of RAM. So obviously these are extremely entry-level specs, and the S1 is a single-core chipset. It's not dual or quad-core like the 400 series. Uh, so as a result, you know, you kind of expect the phone to be very slow, but no, as a whole, when navigating through the UI, it remains fairly swift and responsive. So Samsung definitely played a part in optimizing the user experience. You'll notice immediately that it's running on a fairly clean or vanilla install of Android 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich. It's nice that Samsung didn't include their TouchWiz UI on top just to make things a bit more optimized and light, and as a whole, even though it's outdated for 2017 standards where we now are on Android 7.0, you can still do most of the things that you would want on Android version 4.0. There's access to the standard Google Play Store, you have your suite of connectivity options inclusive of Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth, 3G, and there's also, you know, the standard access to the YouTube client, and you can, of course, download more apps and programs that you need through, again, the Google Play Store. So if we take a quick look at the overall user interface here, the lock screen has been slightly tweaked. We see that we can simply swipe anywhere to unlock, and afterwards I can swipe down again to access the notification shade. The screen gets reasonably bright, and although, again, it's not the sharpest panel out there, especially if you zoom in and take a look at small text, you'll notice that the resolution here, especially if you look at this, is quite uh, lacking. But as a whole, for showing off images and watching videos, it still presents a fairly good experience since colors are decently calibrated and reasonably saturated. Taking a quick look at the phone, indeed we are running on Android 4.0.4 Ice Cream Sandwich, and you can also of course download more widgets, wallpapers, and animations that you would want to customize the experience on board. So all in all, really not bad for a sub $30 phone. In terms of preloaded applications, there's some bloatware, but there's not much. Some apps have been downloaded by uh, TrackPhone just to enhance the usability to contact customer support, but you, again, get a fairly clean install and vanilla install of Android 4.0. You have access to Google Search, there's Playbooks, there's also Google Navigation for turn-by-turn -turn directions, although it requires internet connectivity to uh, operate, and there's also standard Google Maps, Gmail, and the standard utility programs like Clocks and Calendars that you can find 
find on board. The speaker on here does a reasonable job. It gets fairly loud, although it's a little tinny sounding, and again, it's mounted on the rear as opposed to being on the front. So not the best media experience in the world, but at least you do have a standard headphone port, and that definitely improves the audio experience if you're listening to music for longer stretches of time. Considering that 30 bucks is a fraction of the cost of the iPod Touch, this might be a good alternative if you just want to pick it up and use it as a media player. So that certainly is one application that it still does a good job at. So taking a quick look at the web browsing experience next, let's go ahead and toggle on Wi-Fi. Connectivity range seems to be pretty strong despite, again, a uh, low-powered CPU and, again, fairly low-cost internals. So we can see that there's access to the standard WebKit-based browser that uh, Google put out, and by default, you're greeted to the track phone menu on this particular prepaid option. You can see the accelerometer also works and kicks in. Here we can also take a quick look at the keyboard. We can see some slight modifications done by Samsung, uh, where the keyboard now stretches to a larger portion of the screen uh, to really maximize the, the typing experience, which is good because at 3.5 inches, the screen is definitely small by today's standards. However, you know, a few years back, 3.5 inches really was the standard, and that was the size of the iPhone 4S's display. So as a whole, it remains fairly comfortable for typing. It is a multi-touch display, so you can access controls by tapping on two keys at the same time. However, you can see that if you're typing super swiftly, it does have a tendency to lag a little bit, especially if you have some other programs open in the background since the RAM is limited at half a gig. Regardless, it remains a decent typing experience for giving quick messages and emails. If you want to, you can switch to the Chrome browser instead, which is a slightly more optimized to run on lower hardware. It also allows for tab browsing in a slightly more, more cohesive manner. You can see that complex sites like the New York Times will load, but it definitely takes longer to completely render. And there, of course, is some sluggishness and checkerboard patterns if you try to scroll too quickly. Regardless, it remains a okay web browsing experience, and it certainly isn't bad for the price point. You can check your basic uh, news without too many problems, weather information, and of course, images and videos will still load, but again, you have to be a bit more patient. The nice thing of using Chrome is that it can import your bookmarks from the desktop version. So if you are already invested in using Chrome as your desktop browser, it might be a good choice to tap on that and then sign in. So again, I slightly prefer Chrome to the native WebKit browser just because it is a bit faster and more modern. The camera of the Samsung Galaxy Centura is merely a 3 megapixel sensor without LED flash or vanity mirror. However, the interface is simple, it's straightforward and clean, although you lack some of the more advanced options. You simply tap and uh, you can take an image. You can also use digital zoom, although that degrades the quality of your shots. And tapping on settings here, we have a few more things that I can look at, including exposure. I can also change the white balance, the scene selection modes, and also the picture size if you want to downgrade that resolution even more. It's uh, you know by far a HD resolution, and you know it's not going to be as clean or crisp looking in terms of shots compared compared to more expensive models, but it works for the occasional image that you may want to post to social media or save in case of an emergency. And you can easily share your shots as well across your social media services, as you can see. Taking a look at some other sample shots, I can pinch to zoom, there's no problems there, and you can see that colors are fairly natural looking, although it's a little fuzzy if I zoom all the way in since it's a fixed focus sensor. But regardless, for only 3 megapixels, it actually does produce decent shots. Uh, the biggest uh, omission here, or the downside, would be macro shots, so if you get super close to your subjects, because it is a fixed focus sensor, it doesn't tend to uh, capture the most uh, detailed looking image. But regardless, it works. When it comes to phone call quality, we're also fairly impressed with the Galaxy Centura. Note that it uses 3G connectivity as opposed to 4G LTE, and coverage using the Sprint model here uh, can vary between Verizon and Sprint. But as a whole in Seattle, Washington, we consistently got around three bars of reception, and the microphone delivers clean sounding audio regardless of your indoors or outdoors. Now it's not a noise canceling mic, so if you are in a super loud environment like near an airport, it may struggle a bit more, but it works well enough and the earpiece also gets reasonably loud. So that's been our quick look at the Samsung Galaxy Centura, not a powerful phone by a long shot, but it is a testament to what you can get for relatively low amounts of money these days. And even though, again, performance can be occasionally sluggish and you are you know, paying for a slightly low-res display, a fixed-focus camera, and no front-facing camera, the core essentials from browsing the web to taking phone calls and having pretty good battery life are all here for under 30 bucks. So as a backup emergency phone or as a dedicated media player, it really 
isn't that bad. And again, it's a fraction of the cost of more expensive phones. And even by affordable phones, we often say $100. And so 30 bucks is even a third of that. So you can check out more details about the Samsung Galaxy Centura in our written article soon. But for now, this has been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. This has been a closer look at the Samsung Galaxy Centura.